All right, this slideshow is about chemical bonds. So we just finished talking about the periodic table. We're going to look at chemical bonds. Chemical bonds are between atoms within a molecule. And we'll compare this to intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces we'll talk about on the next slide. But a chemical bond is between atoms within a molecule. Breaking and forming them is called a chemical change. And of course, in a chemical change, you make new substances. If we look over to the right, you can see and this is an example of a chemical change, hydrogen and oxygen becoming water. But you can see that the bonds between the hydrogens have been broken, as have the bonds between the oxygens, and the new bonds have been formed to make new substances. Intermolecular forces are much weaker, first of all. Breaking and forming these are a physical change. It's between molecules. So phase changes are a good example. Remember in a phase change, like boiling water, it's the same molecule. We're not going to go into a lot about intermolecular forces in this class, but it's, it's kind of fun to talk about it here. So if we look at, this would be liquid water. When it boils, the water molecules interactions here break, and then the water molecules are just free to move about when they become a gas. But you can see here that they're no longer interacting. But the bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen have not been broken. So we don't have any new stuff. Basically, there's three types of chemical bonds, ionic, covalent, I call it purely covalent, the textbook's going to say covalent, and polar covalent. So ionic bonds are between ions. They're the weakest of chemical bonds. They involve complete electron transfer. They're held together just by the plus-minus attraction. They are polar, and that's a word we haven't used before. Polar means there's a positive and a negative side. Typically, they're between a metal and a nonmetal. So remember, metals lose electrons, nonmetals gain them. That's where you get the charges. So if you look at the next slide, summarize it. Remember, when a metal loses an electron, it's going to become positive. When the nonmetal gains an electron, it'll become negative. The fact that the positive ion is attracted to the negative ion, that's the ionic bond. Right. So just looking here, you can see that the sodium electron from the sodium has moved to the chlorine here. So there's your complete electron transfer. Positive is attracted to the negative. What makes the bond weak is that each of these is very stable. Right? These are basically full valences. If you look at the next slide, right? when sodium loses an electron, it goes from a 3s to a neon configuration, which is very, very stable. When chlorine gains an electron, it goes from 3s2,3p5 to 3s2,3p6, which is also an argon configuration. So the electron transfer results in ions with very stable structures. So separating them gives us things that are still stable. The other extreme, the strongest of chemical bonds, are purely covalent. So a purely covalent bond as equal sharing of electrons, and we'll talk about that in a moment. They're typically between, they are nonpolar, they're typically between two of the same nonmetals, so chlorine, chlorine, oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen, something like that. So in a covalent bond, what's going on is the nucleus of one atom is attracted to the electrons of the other, and vice versa, the nucleus of this hydrogen being attracted to those. And what happens is they pull them towards each other, and then you have this, if you will, the term I'm using, think of it like a tug-of-war between these. Each one's trying to grab onto those electrons, kind of like the seagulls in the Nemo movie, right, with the little fish going, mine, 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 right? And so this here would be the covalent bond. Now, if you think about hydrogen and hydrogen, which has a stronger attraction for electrons? Right. If you look at between Cl2, this is another example. Right? Remember, chlorine is 3s23p5, so this is the Lewis dot structure. In this case, we're just using X's so you can tell them apart. And so what happens is this atom goes, oh, look, there's an electron. Mine. This atom goes, oh, look, there's an electron. And so they start fighting over them. These below are just two other ways we represent it to make it a little cleaner. So again, each chlorine just needs one electron to fill the valence. So they're sharing the electrons. As I've said, it's more like a tug-of-war between opponents of equal skill. So as I asked before, which has a stronger attraction for electrons? Neither one. They're both chlorine. So that means that this pair of electrons is going to be held equidistant 
between the two chlorines, therefore there is no polarity. This is a, just a nicer picture of it. You can see that the chlorines will just share the electrons equally between them, so this would be the electron cloud. Um, interestingly, if you break, if we remember we looked back at the, when we were talking about ionic bonds, we said if you break them up, you get things that are very stable. So they both had noble gas configurations. If we were to break this bond right here, or looking back here, right, back two slides, if we broke this bond here, right, we would end out with these two things. Those two things are called radicals. So a seven electron species it's called a radical, and this is very unstable because it's an S2P5 configuration, right? S2P5, seven electron species. Now, it only needs one electron to fill its valence. That means it's reactive, but it's not enough just to want one electron. If you look at where chlorine is on the periodic table, it's in the upper right-hand corner, which means it has a very strong attraction for electrons. So not only does it want one electron, it's good at getting them. So that's why these are called radicals. Radicals, that term means very reactive. And radicals have been implicated in all sorts of processes like aging, uh, ozone destruction, things like that. All right, the last type are polar covalent bonds. So these are unequal sharing of electrons. Obviously, they're polar. We wouldn't be calling them that. These have intermediate strength, and it's between two different nonmetals. So fluorine, chlorine, carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur chlorine, bromine, anything like that. So just we talked about attraction for electrons. Electronegativity is the big deal here. So remember electronegativity, if you can look back at this last slide, when we talked last set of slides about the periodic table, if you need to review, electronegativity is attraction for electrons in a bond. But it's still attraction for electrons. So attraction for electrons, remember, varies across the row. It increases down a column, it decreases. So the upper right-hand corner are the more electronegative atoms. So just to look at an example, oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So that means if we had a bond between oxygen and hydrogen here, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see the oxygen and the hydrogen. Because oxygen has a stronger attraction, it's going to pull the electrons towards itself. So it's going to hold the pair of electrons in the bonds a little closer. If I pull something negative towards me, it's going to give me some negative character. If it pulls electrons away from something, then it's going to uh, expose the nucleus. This notation here, this is a lowercase Greek letter delta. That, we use the term partial. We stole that from math. So this is a partial negative, partial positive. Now, and we say partial because electrons are not completely transferred. They're just held closer to one than the other. For the purposes of this class, if you just want to write negative and positive, that's fine. But it's important to know which side is the negative and which side is the positive. Um, when there's a difference, whoops, wrong way, sorry. When there's a difference, it's called a dipole moment. That just means that there's, a, there's kind of a point, there's a tipping point. So as I said, polar covalent bonds have unequal distribution of the electrons. You can use electronegativity to determine not only how polar it is, but also which side is the negative side. So, you know, putting it together, the more electronegative atom down here will be the negative side of the bond. So looking back, right, the oxygen is more electronegative, that's the negative side of the bond. Uh, also, the greater the difference in electronegativity, the more polar the bond is, right? So try this on your own, just which side will be the negative side. Hit pause on the slides or on the, the video. Give yourself a minute to try it. The next slide will have the answers. I'll just put them in red. So I'm clicking to the next slide. And you can see the red ones are the negative side, and they are the more electronegative atoms. So fluorine, chlorine, fluorine's more electronegative. Nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen's to the right on the periodic table. Sulfur oxygen, oxygen is above sulfur, and so on. Right. This is a summary slide. Um, textbooks like to draw lines, so we don't really use the actual values here, but um, if you like values like this, but it does summarize it, so if there's very little difference in electronegativity, we call it purely covalent. You know, a large range is polar covalent and really, really big difference in electronegativity, we call it ionic. 
don't worry about the numbers so, so much. It's more important to realize it's a continuum. So the next slide summarizes everything. All right. For the purposes of this class, ionic is metal, nonmetal. Polar covalent is two different nonmetals. And purely covalent is two alike nonmetals. And also just a couple other review things. Metal, nonmetal, right? Ionic has ions. They're polar. Polar covalent are, of course, polar. The more electronegative element is the negative side. And purely covalent bonds are nonpolar. So that should summarize everything for this material. The next set of slides is going to be nomenclature. Have a good one.